Heather Flannery. I'm the founder and chief executive officer of Consensus Health. Uh, I am thrilled to be here today with my esteemed co-panelists to give you a hopeful and optimistic view about the future of healthcare and life sciences as we move through this pandemic and beyond. I'd like, to, I'd like us to start with introductions. Um, I'll, since I'm already talking, I'll quickly say that in addition to the role I play at uh, Consensus Health, I'm also very deeply involved in standards development and various industry activities in health. Well, I'm uh, Alex Kahana. I'm the Chief Medical Officer and uh, responsible for the uh, European, Middle East, and African markets at Consensus Health. I am a professor in pain medicine for over 25 years. I've been involved in technical, technological integration in the clinical workflow for about 15 years. I've been a blockchain aficionado in the last five years, and uh, I'm on a mission to uh, blockchainize healthcare and healthify the crypto space. So it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm looking forward for a lively discussion. Thanks so much, Dr. Ghana. Uh, Dr. Kepsel. I'm David Kapsel. I'm a general counsel and um, chief ethics and compliance officer, as well as Latin America uh, market leader uh, for Consensus Health. Uh, I was a philosophy professor for a decade and a half. I was a lawyer for a decade. Uh, I founded a company about four years ago uh, called Encryption, and I have uh, recently, uh, to great joy, joined uh, Heather and my comrades here at Consensus Health. Thanks so much, Dr. Holt. I am Jonathan Holt. I am a triple board certified physician with certifications in clinical genetics, internal medicine, and clinical informatics. I've been on faculty at Stanford in the Department of Medicine and Vanderbilt in the Departments of Biomedical Informatics and Genetic Medicine. Um, after leaving academics, I started a company called SeekTech Diagnostics, which is a molecular genetics laboratory focused on cancer testing, pharmacogenomics, and food fraud. And I wrote all of the uh, bioinformatics uh, algorithms. Um, I have many different roles, um, including um, HL7, uh, clinical genomics, uh, standards development. Uh, lately, I've been uh, working on the, the co-chair of the IEEE P2416 Identity and Healthcare Working Group. We've been working on cryptographic immunity credentials. I'm a programmer, software architect, and I am the CMIO, the Chief Medical Informatics Officer for Consensus Health. Thank you, Dr. Holt. Dr. Mannion. Yes, hello. My name is uh, Sean Mannion. I am uh, a neuroscientist by training, and I am the Chief Scientific Officer at Consensus Health. Um, my focus there is to not only bring sort of a scientific rubric to a lot of the work we're doing within the healthcare field with, with blockchain and other emerging tech, but also seeing how we can bring these technologies to bear in scientific research and medical research. Um, I recently wrote a book and published a book with uh, journalist uh, Yael Bazavi kennedy called Blockchain for Medical Research, Accelerating Trust in Healthcare, which kind of lays out the whole vision that I hope to see the world move to in the next five years or so, but then... COVID came along and, and my hope now is we can move there in, in the next two years or so, if we can just all put the oars in the water at the same time. Yep, start rowing in the same direction, absolutely. You know, one of the things that is striking, I'm sure to all five of us, we've all been in the blockchain and healthcare community since there was such a community, really. And there's been so much resistance to adoption and resistance to change uh, in our in our industry, I think I think one of the most exciting things is how how much more ready for transformation our industry is after the the uh, the systemic weaknesses have been laid bare for all the world to see as we have struggled to address this pandemic. Um, I'm uh, you know you. Uh, Dr. Kahana, maybe you could kick us off telling a little bit about your perspective on how it's been before and after uh, with respect to what it is we do in emerging technology. Sure, sure. Well, well for, for the audience, I actually live in Manhattan, so I'm like in the epicenter and the dot above the eye of the epicenter of the uh, COVID pandemic here in the U.S. Um, 
I, I think what's striking is when people ask me, oh, Dr. Kahana, what has changed ever since, you know, this, this COVID uh, pandemic? Uh, they think I'll say, well, it's because I'm, uh, I'm working from the house or I'm not eating out. And actually, I say that now everybody's starting to pay attention to what I've been doing, we've been doing in the last five, six years. And honestly, a lot of my colleagues from uh, uh, the university, from uh, the investment and business world, they just simply, they didn't understand what is this blockchain, what is this Bitcoin and Ethereum thing. And now I just go on and when I give conversations, it always starts with, why am I listening to this? And then 45 minutes later, it's like, when can we start? So I, I think it's apt that we say that there are good things that are coming out of this. And it has definitely pushed forward the whole idea of, of, of a new world, a better prepared world ahead. So as we, um, as we examine some of, the, some of the things we've been focused on, uh, I know uh, immunity credentials or other health status credentials has been something under deep discussion and exploration and development for, for years now. My perception, however, is that the, the problem of uh, verifiable credentials with respect to health status has gone from being a, you know, a distant, remote, uh, in the weeds discussion to front and center and extremely urgent and complicated both technically and medically and scientifically and ethically. Uh, I'd love, I know this is a particular area of focus for you, Dr. Holt. Uh, what would you unpack for the audience, your, your thoughts about, uh, about those things and then the rest of the panelists also please jump in in reaction to. Yeah, so uh, Jack Callahan and I have been working on the vaccination credentials and immunity uh, credentials as part of the verifiable credentials. And that, that's part of the working group that we've been involved in in the W3C. And uh, I've actually, um, vaccinations are sort of like the hello world of, of uh, EHRs. It's, it's, uh, we all have vaccinations, at least uh, hopefully we all have vaccinations, that, and we get them all over the world. So by that nature, it's a very much a decentralized solution that actually intersects um, uh, healthcare and identity. Because uh, actually, if you think about physicians, actually, um, uh, your, your, a physician is involved in your identity from birth to death. And physicians sign your birth certificate, they sign your death certificate, and all things in, in between. So uh, about two years ago, three years ago, actually, like, using um, this model of verifiable credentials to model immunization records in order to show the, the provenance and the cryptographic signatures, because it ultimately is, is, is about the signature. And so uh, we've been working out the model actually to describe immunizations, uh, vaccinations, and then proof of immunizations. Um, and lately, actually, that's picked up a lot of steam with uh, this idea of a Im immunity passport that you can actually show maybe at the, at the airport to actually to show that, that basically you can leave your house and live your life normally. Uh, so the challenge with that, and I think there's a lot of uh, momentum right now that's happening about actually this uh, use case of immunity passports. Some of the challenges though is actually it's, um, uh, we don't know the efficacy of the, either the vaccine or if once, once one is, is developed, um, or uh, right now it's, it's not as binary as yes, you're immune, you've had COVID and now you're immune to it. We don't know how, how long that's gonna last, uh, the immunity and how effective it, it, that would be for preventing re reinfection. So certainly it's a, there's a lot more about the, the governance model and the trust framework that actually like once you have a immunity passport or a vac proof of vaccination is actually how it builds into an ecosystem. Nor do we actually n know what the, necessarily the trust models are of let's say Dr. Smith vaccinates you for COVID-19 in Munich, Germany, and then you're arriving in the United States, how would you trust that that uh, that is a, a valid and authentic signature from someone in a healthcare system in a different governance model in, like in say Germany. So I think the technology actually we've, we've got, it's almost uh, ready. And I think right now it's working out all of the, um, the semantic interoperability, the cryptographic interoperability, but then it's ultimately about this idea of trust and actually how and what does that governance and trust framework so actually you can accept those vaccinations or immunizations from abroad or into your healthcare system. 
You know, the uh, two things you mentioned, I think we should have uh, Drs. Mannion and Kepsel uh, pick up on. So, so one of them is, is this issue of trust and governance with respect to very intimate health information, like a, like a health status credential that could be controversial, like our genomic data. Maybe do, uh, Dr. Kepsel, if you could pick up on that. And then um, Dr. Mannion, this, this issue of the speed of science and uh, how it is that we know what we know and how we can speed up getting to knowing what we need to know. Um, Dr. Kepsel. Yeah, so just let me address what I, what I know more about the genomics angle. Um, so I think what Dr. Holt um, was talking about these uh, credentialing and, and um, you know, um, sort of a uh, um, immunal passport, the ability to be able to move freely is certainly, um, important, but there's, there's another very interesting uh, uh, aspect to the basic science here, and that is that there is clearly some sort of genetic component uh, um, that is um, causing people to either get very sick uh, uh, or not. Uh, and this is a huge opportunity. So, you know, not everything is bad because you know, from a scientific perspective, this ongoing conflagration we're in the midst of is a tremendous opportunity to to gather new data, and we get very excited about it in the you know in science. Um, but we also have to guard ourselves um, uh, and not move too quickly, uh, where we could compromise things that could last long into the future. So we'll talk, you know, excitedly about getting all this genetic information, for instance, uh, about people who are sick, about you know, and and comparing it and 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 contrasting it and coming up with really important actionable data about who can move more freely than others for whatever reasons. Um, but uh, in opening those floodgates to get that data in, we have to be very careful about what sorts of compromises we're making for our privacy, for our individual identities long into the future. I think this is a conversation we've been having for the last 20 years really uh, since you know, right after 9-11, uh, you know, we, we um, uh, had some legislation that um, many would say has not, uh, ha has affected us even till now in, in terms of our personal privacy, uh, in terms of the data the government gathers. Um, so we need to build into, we need to design from a, a values perspective, tools that are able to allow us to do is, uh, you know, um, uh, Dr. Holt mentioned, um, fr freely move about, um, but also that don't uh, compromise our, you know, personal identities uh, and expose too much of ourselves for um, others to um, use or abuse. Very well said, David. Very well said. Um, I, I think, you know, going to Heather, your point that um, there are trade-offs when it comes to to science and, and science is essentially the process we have to know, to go from not knowing how to treat this disease to knowing with some level of reliability how to treat this disease. And, and we're watching that process in real time and every attempt that can be made across the planet to speed it up is happening. Um, it's great to see that. Unfortunately, we don't have the infrastructure to speed it up in anything more than an ad hoc way. Um, I think that the tools that we have in blockchain and in other emerging tech are the foundation for that, but it's going to take time to get into place. Um, we're seeing with the, you know, rush to try and get um, some sort of vaccine trial, some sort of treatment trials in place, um, an understanding more broadly amongst policymakers and amongst the general public that these things take time. And the trade-offs between speed, between quality, and between cost are always there. So we can put a lot of money and a lot of effort into it, but it still is, is going to take us some time if we want to know for sure or with a high level of reliability. And that, that trade-off is the, is the one that's always a challenge. And, and I think with, with blockchain, we have a tool that allows us to change the value proposition for moving forward in all of those three areas. I, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit while, while David is talking where privacy fits into there. And I think that's that's part of the cost. I think that to some degree, if you, if you throw privacy out the window, you've, you've given up value for ourselves and, and later down the line that we may want back. And so that, part of that value is the privacy that comes into this question. 
Um, so how and where we can move that forward faster, how we can get that better science, that more high quality science. Um, in, in normal times, you want, you want cheaper uh, research as well, but I don't think that's the main concern right now. And of course, what I like to call faster miracles or faster medical um, treatments that can give improved outcomes is, is the end goal. And I think the, the tools we're working with and, and some of the um, worldwide effort to make this happen are coming together at the right time to, to really speed up not only solutions to this problem, but what if we can use the same framework we set up to speed up the oncology research or, or, or cancer treatments that we, we are trying in the U.S. to have a moonshot for. I think, I think anything we create right now that speeds up solutions will be very valuable later on as well. So I would just say that that's the, sort of like the, the silver lining, which is that really, I think, just as the, uh, the fall of the 2008 financial crisis, you know, but gave birth to new economic models and really to, to the birth of Bitcoin, I think really is that the need for the tools now actually is at, at like the verifiable credentials for immunity passports that don't give up necessarily pri uh, the, your privacy. And I think that really is the birth of the applications of blockchain technologies and zero knowledge proofs that actually is a perfect, um, you know, the, the tools that actually fit this emerging need. And I think uh, unlike the reactionary politics after 2001, 9-11, uh, I think this is actually more of like a, a homebrew, uh, you know, a need actually where the tools actually will help facilitate that science without giving up the privacy. Dr. I would like to yeah, I would like to add here that, you know, I'm listening to this conversation and, and what, what comes up to mind is that, you know, technology at the end doesn't do anything. It's what people do with technology. What's the intent behind it? And so when I look at it, I listen, you know, about immunization passports, what is it? Is it, is it part of a global strategy to eradicate the virus? Is there a global strategy to eradicate the virus? I'm not sure. I know I'm seeing it from a tactical perspective, a lot of things that countries are trying to do. But as a planet, is there a concerted and coordinated effort to actually eradicate the, the virus? So at the end of the day, you know, we, 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 we are left with very powerful tools uh, and, and, and we move very quickly into the uh, how without talking about the why. You know, why are we doing all these things? And, and I think that there is a, a, a confusion between uh, collaboration and this creation of crowd intelligence and what, you know, Sean alluded to this, this great scientific effort because none of us is as good as all of us, which is laudable and actually a very good thing that is coming out of COVID versus the idea of centralization versus this idea that they're going to be centralized bodies that are going to issue permissions for us to move, to, 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 to interact, to be. We are living through very intrusive times. These lockdowns, you know, they are weighing upon us. And, and, and this procurement of, of, of information, of data upon us, uh, to go back to what David was starting to talk about, is that we are our actions, what we do. And our, what we do is captured by our activity. By, by our geolocation, by our searches, by our texts, by, by our, uh, 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 um, the way we interact with each other. And so when there are third parties that take this information and use it and abuse it, and lose it, and sell it, they're actually taking pieces of us. So as we're going to talk today about uh, uh, cybersecurity and we're going to talk about authentication and verification, all these are important things. What we are dealing with is not privacy preserving technologies, but dignity preserving technologies. It's about changing who we are and what we are as human beings. And that's really what it is. And to quote Yuval Harari, are we entering and, and allowing a, a, a biosurveillance in a post-pandemic world? And so this is very serious. And I'm glad that my colleagues here spoke about 9-11 because that was the beginning of this discussion. But I think that people are not familiar or severely underestimate what not the technologies are, but what we can do with those technologies for better and for worse. You know, I, if it's all right, I'd love to follow on that, on that thought that, uh, you know, throughout me, Countless examples throughout humanity becomes fearful, particularly the 
repeatedly has been willing to trade our freedom over and over and over again. And then society is in a position where it has to claw it back. It has, it has to win back after it was traded for, for safety. Uh, this has been going on in human history, uh, cycle after cycle. What is particularly compelling to me and has, I know all of us at Consensus Health so, so passionately engaged is that the family of technologies that we're working with right now, uh, enterprise Ethereum, the Ethereum mainnet, advanced privacy preserving cryptographies and uh, cryptography and hardware solutions and new approaches for federated learning, like uh, those, those things, those technologies implemented in ethical governance models and, and implemented to their fullest potential, they have the, the, they create the possibility for us to resolve that tension, remove that pretty first time in human history where we do not have to choose between our privacy and our security. We don't have to choose between, between public health and, and civil liberties. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a powerful, powerful opportunity. And uh, we're so used to arguing in these very polarized, very, very uh, from radically different perspectives and priorities. Well, we're working with technology today, particularly in the Stop COVID-19 hackathon and related work we're doing at Consensus Health that, that can, you know, we no longer have to choose between corporate and governmental hegemony <laughs> or, uh, or, or these other opportunities. So, uh, I, yeah, I, I do think we should, we should tell the audience some things about the hackathon too. But before that, anyone want to jump in on that? If I could strike a cautionary note. Uh, so I think Alex is uh, absolutely right when he says it's not really, you know, technologies are, are neutral. So the technology that we're all very excited about and, and have been working in for quite some time is, you know, is, is prone to being used in, uh, for tremendous good, but not immune from being used for harm. Um, so we need people who are capable of recognizing one from the other uh, and implementing uh, design uh, in, in ways that, you know, that instantiate the good um, into the artifacts we build as well. So, you know, I, I, I often, you know, being in the blockchain world now for about four years, I often hear the sort of techno-utopian, you know, uh, blockchain um, mantra that, you know, it's, it's, it can, it's um, you know, it can usher in a new age, but it's really still very much up to us how we implement things using this technology. So just to... I, I'm with you, I, and I feel I feel the enthusiasm. But we, we have we have responsibility as individual actors too, who build things and who use things um, to do so in ways that are ethical. And I think to piggyback on that a little bit, um, one of the challenges we have, you know, the old saying, "When's the best time to plant a tree?" Twenty years ago. When's the second best time today? We're facing that with the infrastructure we're looking for. The best time to build it was five years ago. Um, maybe we didn't have all the tools or the sense that we could, but the second best time is today. But if we build it and bake too much into it without thinking forward, um, it could be challenging. So we need to build it both for the short term and for the long term. And we need to make sure we have the appropriate representation, have the appropriate access, have the appropriate governance, both for quick functionality, but also not lock that in so that we can, it, we can open it up for everybody and for maximum benefit for the world in the long term. Yeah, and I think at the heart of, um, I think what you mentioned, Heather, was that really this idea of data democratization, of, you know, this idea of owning your own data, and how you do that is actually the center of that is, is owning your own identity. And so I think it really is about the self-sovereignty of, of this really it's a public distributed public key infrastructure is really at the, at the base of what uh, blockchain technologies facilitate is this idea of a, a public key that actually like you have a pseudo identity, but it is attaching a real identity to that. They actually, that then you can actually have uh, encryption and security and uh, auditability and be able to cryptographically sign um, attestations. 
I, I, I would like. I would love to add. I, I know Heather, you asked about the hackathon, and I'm sure that uh, uh, the folks here will, 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 will respond to that. But I also think that this is a new that we have an opportunity here in human history that we haven't had before. And I'll and I'll quote here Atul Gawande, and saying this is the first time in history where we can't say that we're doing wrong things because of ignorance. You know, we can't plead ignorance here. And that decisions that we make for the betterment of the planet or not are really out of ineptitude, that we decide that we don't want to pursue it. And one of the beauty, and I think the magic of blockchain, you know, and what we're doing, and there are a lot of, the blockchain can do a lot of things and different people are attracted to different features of it. And, uh, but, but this is this opportunity, so a peer-to-peer economic activity. And when I say economic, I also mean transfer of information, transfer of data, transfer of radical empathy, empathy as a, as a transaction. We have this opportunity now to do this unmitigated by representatives who actually don't represent us or translators who don't translate us. And, and we can do this without friction, without fees, without losing the value that's in between. So this is what's so exciting that with these technologies that you mentioned that we're working here at Consensus Health and that folks are working on throughout the hackathon, we can create this swarm intelligence, this collective intelligence with a true, here, this is what we're talking. We are virtual, but we are even closer and, 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 and not need to be dependent on others that we're not familiar with their, their, their true incentives behind their behavior. No, very, very, very true, Dr. Kahana. And, you know, um, at Consensus Health, with the, uh, when the pandemic began to set in, uh, we set two immediate priorities, one of which was uh, accelerating our pre-existing work uh, around federated analytics and federated learning with advanced privacy, preserving technologies, and distributed or decentralized machine learning. Uh, we believe that that has extraordinary potential uh, to, to improve pandemic resilience, as well as translate across a huge range of disease states and conditions. But we also knew we needed to engage our global community. Uh, we, we, have, we are in an unprecedented, uh, an unprecedented time with the COVID-19 pandemic. And there are certain things about the Ethereum ecosystem that are just absolutely extraordinary. The level of passion and community and connectedness, the sense of shared mission and shared values distributed all over the world. So we reached out to our colleagues at, at Gitcoin that were already doing some incredible things with Gitcoin grants uh, related, related to COVID-19. They sprung into action in such an impressive way. And uh, we set a goal for ourselves to do something extraordinary with a new kind of hackathon, with a new sort of ethos. And uh, I'd love maybe if um, you could introduce some of some of the thinking about why we decided to immediately prioritize that and 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 work as hard on it as we have, uh, Dr. Holt. Yeah. So um, over the last uh, four years, I have participated in or uh, ran about five different hackathons. And to quote one of my colleagues, uh, Rika, is that hackathons represent all the good that there is in this world, the power of these diverse teams to turn revolutionary ideas into reality. And I think it really is this hacker mindset is that we're just not going to sit idle and be uh, uh, helpless bystanders. We're actually going to tackle it with the right attitude, skills and awareness. And uh, so my background is that I'm a physician, but bef the reason why I became a physician is that when I was 13, I saw a, a motorcycle accident and I was I sat there helpless for 30 minutes and I, and I didn't know I could, I didn't have any skills or actually to be able to help out. And it really motivated me to become a paramedic and ultimately be a physician. And it really is the attitude, the scare, skills and awareness that actually we're going to, we're going to tackle this. We're actually going to solve these different hard problems and bring the right, um, that mindset to actually to this the, this crisis, and it really is that the the attitude is that you're not going to be a helpless bystander during this crisis. You have the skills that you can do good in this world, and you're aware where there's a wrong, and um, where actually you can make that right. And so, um, it really I think it it empowers you know that that we're just not going to sit idle. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and so a couple of themes I, I'd love to pick up on. So we took a new approach with mentors. Usually I've participated in a number of hackathons as well and love them. And generally it's in the mentor role that, that I that I play, you know, business business or entrepreneurship kind of kind of role. And I would say on average it's a ratio of maybe, you know, two to three to five mentors to 20 to 50 hackers, you know, on average, something like that. We took a really different approach uh, with, with our hackathon. Maybe Sean, you could unpack what that's been all about and uh, how it's worked. It's really quite unique. Definitely. Um, it's it's uh, been very educational for me and for, I think, both the mentors and the hackers. We, we brought in uh, mentors largely from the health and life sciences field, some with um, technical know-how and some a little bit um, uh, new, new to this type of event. Uh, what this did was allow us to give those groups of hackers, especially those who themselves didn't have a good sense of what the realities were in, in healthcare and, and some of the pain points in the current crisis and, and, in, and in healthcare and research in general, and pair them up with the mentors who could give them that real world experience. Uh, unfortunately for anyone who knows healthcare, it's not always a logical, insane place. And so navigating that and building tools that can fix problems there really it was able to be advanced faster with um, those mentors working together with the teams. And we've had both um, asynchronous and, and offline interactions, as well as some unconferences that we've been holding weekly and open office hours. Um, I've learned a lot. It's been educational for me. And we have, we have mentors coming from, from federal uh, healthcare providers and researchers to folks from hospitals, nonprofits, academic centers, as well as different private, private industry, um, big and small companies. And I think the, the learning on both sides, the mentors and the hackers, um, it's, it's apparent in some of these events. People have thanked us that, that it really opened their eyes into how to shape their product to, as they put it together. And so I, I think it's something we, we not only will see better results from in a um, real, real world practical sense at the end of this, but I think it's something that some people want to see repeated. And I, I think hopefully we will be doing so in, in not too long a time. Yeah, we, we have over, uh, I believe we have over 50 mentors, 40 projects underway across, uh, 500, more than 500 participants spread across 70 countries. I get that right. Yep. Okay. It's uh, it's it's been incredible to see the kind of global global engagement and unity. And one other thing uh, that is unique about what we're doing is is we took three different open source software communities and brought them together with around very particular goals. And that's the Ethereum open source community the Hyperledger community with a particular focus on Hyperledger Bazoo and Hyperledger Avalon, and the open mind community that focuses on privacy preserving artificial intelligence. Uh, and so we are looking at not just blockchain at all, but the convergence of three families of technologies across multiple global open source communities with the focus of more domain experts than have ever been involved in any hackathon that I'm aware of. So we're we're uh, we're so uh, we're so hopeful. Maybe we could uh, tell a little bit about our our judges, uh, some of which are on the line with us right now. Uh, those of you who are judging, in the it, raise your hand on camera. Okay, so we've got three judges. I, I, I would like to say, as a physician, you know that that grew up through this revolution of digital medicine. Um, this is the first time that I actually, in, in, in my decades of experience, have the opportunity to talk with programmers and with coders face to face. You know, everyday life, we as physicians live in a world surrounded by technology that wasn't designed for us or by us. And not to be, a, 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 you know, a unnecessarily negative, but I'm sure that people are aware of the physician burnout that is going on. A lot of it driven by the inappropriate electronic health records that are out there. And so if you think about it, that there are doctors that take their lives because they think that life is better not logging into an electronic health record. This is unbelievable. This is unbelievable the burden that this digitization has created that instead of having the promise 
of better care at lower costs, we have higher burnout rates at higher costs. And it doesn't improve the quality of the therapeutic dialogue. This is why I think we always have to talk about the why and not the how. And so when people ask me, Alex, what is the difference between digital medicine or M medicine or I medicine, or I health and all the things that we do now versus what we're trying to do, the blockchain health or the blockchainized health or the DLT health, is that everything that we do better or worse beforehand was patient or citizen centric. So it's a bunch of folks that are sitting around trying to do something that has a better UI UX and is trying to make things kind of feel a little bit better, cheaper, faster, better. But what we are doing through the, uh, our technologies is making it patient or citizen driven, that it's actually going to enable people to increase their capabilities and their capacities, the capacity to, to, to withhold uh, uh, when, when, when things are tough and the capability to bounce back, which is both of them the definition of resilience. So, so that's, that's the beauty of this, that, that, that what makes it unique is that we are, this is the peer to peer culture. We're not just talking about it, we are exercising it and I'm very proud to be part of this. Thank yeah, you. and certainly I think the other thing would be about automation. So I think it really is that the blockchain technology distributed public key infrastructure. I'm looking just on my, on my desk, I, I applied for my emergency credentials here in Illinois to actually get my Illinois medical license in order to, uh, to help in the McCormick Place uh, makeshift hospital. And, uh, and so I had to get um, uh, pieces of paper printed out signed and sent to my, uh, Tennessee to actually, for Tennessee to um, uh, uh, certify that I actually am licensed in, in Tennessee. And yet I still had to go get my fingerprints done uh, for my background check. And it all got held up because I didn't send $10 in the mail. So I actually like you. And so I think certainly it's right for automation or another piece of paper that's on, on my desk is um, the person's under investigation for COVID-19. And so right now it takes 30 minutes for a physician to actually fill out that piece of paper and fax it. And I could you not fax it to the CDC for, and this is actually the, the, the where the, you know, the, the, the current practices is still done by fax in, in healthcare. So I think that it's, it's ample opportunities for automation and an improvement of these different processes. And, and it's, it's even worse, Jonathan, it's by design. It's intended to be like that. that, that that's what's really so insane, that it, is, it, it, you know, it serves all the intermediaries that are on the way, that $10, that fax, that fingerprint, that another fingerprint, that person that calls you and says, oh, you didn't get this immunization, and then say, no, but I'm allergic to that immunization. You know, it's just like all these silly things that are going, it is by design and it is maintained to be in that state. And that, that's what's so uh, liberating and what we're trying to do here. It's any consolation, uh, the legal profession is no better. <laughs> The, all of these professions are, are very intent on, you know, policing their memberships and making things obscure. And, you know, I suppose it's also true for clergy. Um, so, you know, this is a, this is a general problem. And the, the notion or the philosophy of decentralization and peer-to-peer -peer networks and um, distributed trust uh, um, are all meant uh, to uh, help undo that sort of hierarchy. Um, to make things work better. Um, unfortunately, for the same reasons, they're, they're distrusted by those uh, hierarchies. You know, it's really interesting. Uh, healthcare and, and is an industry that is almost defined by the misalignment of its various stakeholder groups. It is, if you were to describe what is this industry exactly, you might say something like, well, there's a half a dozen or more very powerful and disempowered stakeholder groups, all of whose interests are diametrically opposing in an n-dimensional array. You would think it was impossible, yet it's true. <laughs> it's uh, it's 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 really it's it's really strange. Uh, one of the one of the greatest opportunities that we have uh, at, at Consensus Health and in the Ethereum ecosystem is the opportunity to design new incentive structures structure those as hypotheses. For example, we don't know whether some incentive is actually going to produce the outcome that we hope it will. And it would be irresponsible of us to assert that it would or it could. 
But what we can do and what we should do is design experiments that give us an opportunity to assess how different incentive structures actually change the behaviors of the stakeholders in competing interests. And we have, for the first time with tokenization, the opportunity to to adjust and implement those incentives at a kind of speed and a pace and with transparency and auditability of that that is completely unprecedented. Uh, when you when you layer on the ability to to create a model that that tests or assesses the way some new incentive structure works, and you you pair with it the ability to protect the dignity and the privacy and the liberty of the subject patient population, you get something that's so powerful. It's so powerful it boggles the mind. Uh, so we we sit here now at the beginning of a revolution in our industry, in healthcare and life sciences, that, that we think is as significant as what happened when the Genesis block encoded a recent bank bailout uh, and, and Satoshi took action and decided to change the dynamics of control in the world forever. And uh, uh, Dr. Kahana, what were you gonna say? Well, I would say that, that, that when you speak, it reminds me of a conversation that I have usually with executives. If we use the blockchain parlance, it's almost as if we created an economy where we trade in death coins. In other words, these coins are produced Terrible. When you're sicker, of course, because if, you, if, if there's a pill for every ill and a test for every pest, and the more you utilize the system and let's have more surgery, and I, that's how the system thrives. But if, God forbid, I have all my patients that do well and they're healthy, I killed the system. Now, it's all by design because I don't recall the 11th commandment saying thou shall have all these patients sick forever, you know, and create all these sustained problems and dysfunctions that we have. So it is really about a, a, a behavior economic design. And what I love about what we're doing and what about, about blockchain is it's about the past because we have everything written in ledgers. I'm a big history buff and I love to see everything there written and it's, and it's, and it's immutable, but it's also about the future, like you mentioned, it's hedging on behavior. How can I encourage people? And that's what I did in pain medicine throughout my career. How do you encourage people to, to engage in behavior? So we transform people from passive consumers of health services to active health and now thanks to blockchain, also wealth producers. And this is what's so exciting. It's not the why, it's, it's not the how, it's the why are we doing this? And it's again, human driven. It's we're going to be part of our destiny. Yeah, and I think that goes back to the, so like the hacker philosophy is really is like, we're just not going to be, be idle. And I think it really, I think in healthcare, healthcare is slow to adopt new technology or to change, but you know, change is, is change management is, is, is good. And you know, the future, it just, it's not what it used to be. And so I think, but really it's about, you know, going to like the, where we're following like the McKenzie's five phases of this during, and we have the themes of the hackathon is the resolve, resilience, return, reimagination and reform. The first piece of that is the resolve to get us through this current crisis to contain, mitigate and suppress. But it really is about standing resolute in our character as we, as we tackle this um, and make sure we're making the right decisions. The next is resilience, the ability to persevere during this crisis, return to some semblance of normal, but then it's that reimagination of re-engineering what that future may look like and really the reform of actually that change management of what the new normal is gonna look like. And I think this is the opportunity that we have you know, by design, just like you know, the reactionary politics of, of September 11th to the change that occurred after the 2008 financial crisis that actually led to the birth of Bitcoin and blockchain technologies. Now is the time for that same occurrence, the refer, reform that we need in healthcare. And I think that, I think that on, you know, those two just inspired me because I just realized that we're halfway to where we need to be. Um, you know, this is not just a silver lining, it might be a golden lining. On January 1st of this year, we all know healthcare needed reform for the reasons we've just outlined. And we have a disruptive technology in blockchain that we were looking to disrupt that system and build a new one. COVID just disrupted that system for us. We're halfway there. All we need to do is now take blockchain, shift our mindset and make it a healing technology 
And I think that's what the teams in the hackathon are doing. They're finding ways to make it better. And they're not doing that just with the support of Gitcoin and consensus and those folks who've already been trying to bring this technology to bear. They're doing it with parts of the legacy system. We've got KPMG, we've got Lidos putting up prize money for this. We've got judges coming from the federal government because they know that legacy is gone. It's already been disrupted and we need to build a new, uh, build a new future in the same way that the, you know, uh, that, that Alex and, and John and uh, David have just outlined. You know, a, a point I wanted to make uh, when I was going on a rant about incentives, you know, it's not that the industry hasn't been working for a long time through a process that's called the transition from volume to value. And there's been, you know, evolutions uh, and massive effort, but still healthcare is $10 trillion globally with worsening population health endpoints uh, around the world. And uh, so, so the transition from volume to value, let's just say it's been really slow and really incremental and you know just let's let's just move one millimeter at a time and now with the disruption that that dr Mannion highlights yeah it's it's it is completely disrupted right now but what it remains it, to, to the mention about about the the honor of having uh uh sitting leaders uh from uh, the, the u.s federal government participating as in ju as judges what that speaks to is the reality of who pays for healthcare, who pays for healthcare and life sciences. It's different in different economies all around the world, but what is not in any way disputed is of that gross $10 trillion of economic volume, the vast majority of that is paid for by taxpayers or philanthropic donate donors. Uh, and and that, uh, that means government, that means of the people, for the people, by the people, Right. That's where that the vast majority of all that money is coming from. So if you want to talk about how to transform and restructure healthcare and life sciences, it cannot be in in an oppositional view with governments around the world. It must be in a partnership model. It has to be collaborative and positive and and, you know, operating from the belief that that these parties are doing this. You know, the pre-round world, everyone is striving and doing their utmost. So we'll be joining us that you can meet on the, on the 18th, which is when we will be announcing our winners on May 18th at 12 p.m. Eastern time. You can join uh, Joseph Lubin, Vitalik Buterin, Brian Bellendorf, the executive director of, of Hyperledger, several leaders from Consensus Health, uh, another judge yet to be announced, and two government executives. One is the chief information officer and acting data, uh, chief data officer of the Department of Health and Human Services. That is the inimitable Jose Arrieta. And the other is the chief innovation officer of the Department of Veteran Affairs, which is the largest integrated health system in the United States and one of those, one of the largest in the world. And that is Mr. Michael Akinule. And we will be uh, those, the partnership of techno technical leaders, medical leaders and public sector leaders coming together to do the, the weighty work of this judging. We really hope you will join us to, to hear how that goes. Uh, so I think we should start taking questions from the audience. What do you, what do you gentlemen think? Yes? Yep. All right. All right. So, our, uh, so please go ahead and get your questions in the chat. We'll take as many as we can. Um, I'm going to I'm going to uh, read them out and then um, panelists. Let's let's try to give lightning round kinds of answers so that we can take as many as uh, as many as we're able. Uh, okay, our first question is from Indira. Uh, how do we implement these new models on top of the current outdated system structure and behaviors? As as uh, Dr. Kahana says, uh, this goes way beyond changing patient behavior. Uh, excellent point. Who'd like to take that one first? Dr. Mannion. I, I, I think there you need to, to look at it use case by use case. I think we, we, we need to have the ear of, of the top down so that they 
move things the way that's needed to, to allow new solutions. But I think the solutions you're getting from the hackathon, the solutions you're getting from a thousand different, you know, small companies out there, those are the seeds from the grassroots that will come up. But I think they get integrated. I think they get grown. I think they get implemented very differently in different use cases. And I think you need to work with the stakeholders. As, as you said, Heather, we need to do this collaboratively. You need to work with the stakeholders in those places. For me in medical research, I think that there needs to be a very stepwise fashion for piloting, for R&D, for funding coming for these things. So it's not just coming from the known, the known areas. Um, so I think that that, that um, use case by use case advancement and, and evolution is what we're gonna have to see. I, I would suggest a way to to approach this that I, that, that I do uh, quite often with with various stakeholders, and that is to do a little uh, um, exercise in simulation. And what you find out in that simulation when you ask people just three very simple questions: What are your pain points? How would you fix it? And what is value? And you see three things come up. One is that the pain points are all the same. Everybody is complaining about the same thing about frozen data, data in silos, lack of uh, interoperability, too much friction, uh, di you know, digital fragility, cybersecurity. Everybody more or less agrees on nine out of 10 reasons of what makes their life difficult. But then it comes into how to fix it. And although every st different stakeholder, be it government versus industry versus patients versus hospitals versus providers, it doesn't matter whom, uh, what, what you see is very interesting, even though the solutions might be different, none, none of them, and I've yet to see one who says, this is what I will do to change. So we're playing in this blame game that the problem that we have, so, so patients say that's because of the government, the government is because of the hospitals, the hospitals because of the payers, the payers are because of the doctors, and everybody is pointing fingers to each other. So until we don't ask ourselves questions about what can I do to stop trading in death points, this won't change. And the third thing, which is the most important, is to redefine what value is. And unfortunately, we live in an economic school of thought that value equals quality divided by cost. And that has two problems. One is that quality for some, is, uh, quality for each stakeholder is different. What is quality for a patient is not quality for a government, which is not quality for the industry. And so we're not talking about same things. And then when you have cost in the denominator, by default, all the strategies are about cost suppression. So it's almost like the story of the farmer who had a mule and the mule died. And he said, it's such a shame because last week he learned how to work without eating and drinking. So how do we do more and more with less and less and have no food and no water and things will assist us down? So we need to change the equation of value and the equation of value that I uh, offer or suggest to uh, the audience is think about what you want to give divided by what you want to get. Of course, what you want to get is easy. Everybody wants to get a lot for free, for nothing, a lot of revenue, a lot. Yes, yeah, but what do you want to give? And so patients who don't want to give up on bad habits, industry that doesn't want to give up on fast prof profits, governments that don't want to give up on, 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 on control or infrastructure, this cannot work until we ask ourselves, what is the skin, what is our skin in this game? And that is why DLT is such a powerful way of looking at it because it creates through game theory that type of economics. What do I want to do in order for this to maintain the mainnet, to maintain the network and make this work? So I, I used to teach um, ethics uh, for engineers and all my students were engineers and were not that interested in philosophy, uh, but they were very good and interested in engineering. And I used to recommend to them two books really to, uh, that I think will answer the, will help answer the, the question. Read Don Norman's The Design of Everyday Things, which is a brilliant book. So simple and elegant and insightful. Uh, good for everybody, even if you're not an engineer. Um, uh, and also um, Cass Sunstein's Nudge. I think both of those taken together uh, can help you to address some of the concerns raised in the, the question that was posed. Thank you. So, uh, so we've got, we've got a bunch of questions. We've got five minutes. So I want to let, let's, uh, let's lightning round these. So, uh, first, 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 uh, healthcare data records, 
we live in a reality where, you know, a few really large players dominate the EHR market. Is there going to be room for a lot of players or just a few big ones when it comes to data records in a, in a, you know, post blockchain adoption world? It's going to be everywhere. Going to be everywhere. Micro, micro electronic health records, Africa, India. Okay. Uh, and then, oh, here's a tough one. This is one we're actively trying to figure out ourselves, which is everyone understands that identity is a really big deal for healthcare on blockchain, right? Really, really super big deal. But what kind of time frame are we looking at here before when we have solutions we can realistically, ethically, legally, technically deploy? I'm going to point Sorry. that to you, Dr. Holt. What's the yeah. time? No, so oh, and Dr. Mannion. So the technology is, is there, actually, it's really working out the semantics and the cryptographic interoperability. I'm heavily involved in this. I think it's a bit premature to say the immunity credentials are ready to go today. Some people are trying to push them. Um, but I think certainly uh, with this sufficient nudge, I think we can get it over the finish line in the next 12 months, hopefully in time for a vaccine. Oh, we have gone on the record. 12 months, folks. Let the timer begin. Uh, Dr. Mannion, <laughs> what were you going to say? And I don't, I don't have a solution for, for the electronic health record identity, but I think you look to um, associated areas like research where ORCID or ORCID has, is a nonprofit system of 8 million registered researchers that has largely worked to resolve some of the identity in a non-blockchain way and without the same PII and PHI, personal health information issues. And so it was a perfect testing ground for how identity works into this world of medical research and then this world of medicine in a, in a backdoor kind of way. Mm -hmm. Well, here's an interesting question. It'll challenge, challenge some of our framing of these issues. Um, Mr. Michael Marchant would like to know if we could only choose one to prioritize first, would it be consent management or identity? And I would suggest that we can't do consent management without identity, but I'm not sure how anyone else feels about it. Panelists. Agreed. That it, to me, identity. everything everything follows identity uh, yeah. in healthcare. Uh, Dr. Khanna, sorry. Yeah, in, in the world, not, not just healthcare. Our identity, our self sovereign self. It's, it's it's as simple as that. That's that you cannot have a human driven culture where we are masters to our destiny if we are if we don't have our own identity that is ours, that is portable, that is in our control, and that we can permission others to look at it, to touch it, to share with. It's, it's, it's all about identity, not in healthcare, but in everything. But also it's actually in the specification, it's actually baking in policy into the credentials of actually how it's, it's being used. And, and we're actively working on that. Yeah, and one thing I'll say uh, about that is consent management in healthcare in the current state is a totally broken system. Everybody in the industry understands. The consents that are given are blanket consents one, one future state characteristic is granular, transaction-specific, time-bound consents for, for use of data for a, a, a range of scenarios. And the question is asked, well, why would we be working on anything but identity? Uh, given, given what we just said, why would we be thinking about anything but identity? And uh, I would say parallel paths, uh, re reactions to that? Uh, certainly, uh, identity is the first of our five pillars. And that's not a merely a technical issue, obviously. there's I mean, it's a social object. You, you are a social object, and so we have to figure out, in a broader context, from an ethical and um, governance perspective, what constitutes identity and, you know, what, is, what are the granular features of it? And what are, what's the relationship if once you have identity, how do you, how do you choose whether to disclose your identity and to preserve your privacy and your dignity uh, in, those, in those cases? Um, so so uh, we are sadly at time. It's just getting, it's just heating up, but uh, we look forward to, we look forward to more engagement. Thank you, bye-bye.